So it's a true joy to have her here today. Would you welcome the Reverend Kristen Powell. Wow, do you have it going on at Unity of the Blue Ridge, huh? I had to look back. I was sitting in the front row when all the members were up here to see if anybody was left. <laughs> Glad there are a few of you who have been here for a while. So exciting. I've been, you know, as Darlene mentioned, we've been prayer partners for these 12 years, and so we've really seen each other through the ups and downs of life and the ups and downs of our ministries, and I've gotten to visit her at every one of her ministries, which, not that she's had that many, but this is her fourth. And I, I have to truly say that this is it for her. <laughs> they were all lovely, but this is home. And uh, I'm just thrilled that she has found home and it's with you. So you must be pretty special people because she's pretty special to me. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know how valuable you are? Do you? Oh, who said that? He just knows it. Emil, I greeted him on the way in. Really, truly, how precious you are. How that you don't have to do anything or say anything or be anything to have the love of spirit. Do you really know that? Boy, it's been a long journey for me to know that, and I'm still learning. I might know it up here, as, as Darlene said, but that journey from head to heart, that 18-inch journey seems like a long way sometimes to getting to really get that. And what has really helped me understand more and more and more and unfold more and more and more of who I am and my true worth and my value and understand that is unity, the teachings of unity. I grew up in a Lutheran church, and it was the most conservative branch of Lutheran, so it's called the Missouri Synod Lutheran. And it was very formal, you know, we'd be nodded out by the ushers row by row at the end, and we had a red-faced preacher who, you know, did, did some hell fire and brimstone. Um, and then we sang some dirgy hymns, and that was sort of, <laughs> sort of a rap. <laughs> But even as a child, you know, I, I'm grateful for that experience because it did nurture my faith and it did give me a love for the church experience, even though it wasn't exactly what I had dreamed about or even knew was possible. My sister introduced me to Unity in 1991, and when I went the first time, I enjoyed the service, and afterwards I was in the fellowship in the bookstore area, and I thought, these people are unnaturally happy. <laughs> There is something going on here. <laughs> I honestly didn't know that that could be real joy, that, that that kind of happiness could be real. I questioned it. I thought it maybe, maybe you can relate to that. Maybe your first experiences were kind of like, those people are a little too happy, clappy, and huggy. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got into classes because I wanted to know more. I got more and more interested. And one of the first classes, they said I could be like Jesus. It was the Discover the Power Within You class by Eric Butterworth. And I said, say what? <laughs> I could be like Jesus? Woo, this place is blasphemous, you know? <laughs> And as it turns out, that is the very truth of who we are, the very truth of our journey, that we can be like any divine master we might imagine, because we are all the sons and daughters of God. We are all born of original virtue, and our path is generally to remember. So now I want to take you across the world with me, because I love to travel. So let's travel in our minds. We'll, we'll do a little armchair travel. That's always fun, too. So imagine it's 1957, and we're in Thailand. And in 1957 in Thailand, there was a monastery where a road was going to be built through the monastery, and so they had to move the whole monastery. And one of the things that was most precious to the monks there was this big earthen clay statue of the Buddha, ten and a half feet, very, very heavy. And so they went to move the statue, because that was going to be part of what needed to happen, and they brought in a crane to do so, and when they did, there was a crack that occurred on the outside of the statue. And so the head monk said, put it down, put it down, and then it began to rain. <laughs> so they had to put tarps over it. 
But in the middle of the night, the monk couldn't sleep. And so he got out a flashlight and he went out and he peeked under the tarp and he started shining it around. And he was so surprised that light shone back at him. So curious about that, that he went to investigate a little bit further. And as he shone the light a little bit more, more and more light shone back at him. So he went and got some tools. He went and got a ladder and a chisel. And it was, took, it was actually quite an act of courage because this was a you know, really precious statue to them. But he needed to know what was that that was shining back. And so as he began to remove more and more of the material, more and more of this light, this radiant light came back, this golden substance. By the morning, the other monks came in, woke up and came out and joined him. And so by full light of day, this statue was revealed, solid gold, two and a half tons. Today it's valued at about $260 million. And it's a real place, a real story. In Thailand, you can go to the Temple of the Golden Buddha and experience this. And so, you know, this story, what, what happened? Why did it ever get covered up? Well, hundreds of years before, the Burmese army was coming through, and there was a monastery there. At that time, it was Siam, not Thailand. And the monks knew that the Burmese army, once they, got, they saw this golden statue, would steal it. And so they decided to cover it up and they put the clay, this thick layer of clay, all around the statue. Well, all of those monks were wiped out by the Burmese army. So their secret died with them for generations, hundreds of years. And now the secret was revealed at the right and perfect time. How many of you have heard of Dr. Brene Brown? Anybody heard of her? Oh, several of you. Well, I really encourage you to check her out. She's done a couple of TED Talks and her specialty, she's a scholar, a university professor and in the field really of social work. And so her, her specialties are vulnerability and shame. She has a talk, Power of Vulnerability and another one, Listening to Shame. And what I've come to realize is shame is the shadow of our worth. Shame is the place to do our work when we really want to come into the fullness of who we are. So Dr. Brene Brown says that shame is something we really, obviously if she's chosen it, is one of the things to focus on, that it's something she says that is very much permeating our culture. She said it's lethal and we're swimming in it. She was interviewed on Oprah and said that. And so what is it about this thing, shame? I mean, most of us, it's just something so buried we don't even want to acknowledge that we feel it, but all of us have this capacity for shame. And, and what is shame? It's important to distinguish it between guilt, because often we put those two things together. Guilt is when we make a mistake, and we just feel bad we made a mistake, right? And then we choose to do whatever we're going to do about that. Shame is when we think we are a mistake. Quite different, right? Well, I just, I, even saying that, I just feel that like, ugh. Oh. Yeah, guilt is thinking we made a mistake. Shame is thinking we are a mistake. And so when we think we are a mistake, we come out of that old thinking, you know, that we are born in original sin, that there's something wrong with us. That's what my family used to say. We used to say, if we made a mistake or someone in the family made a mistake, we'd say, what's wrong with you? Or what's wrong with me? And so that was like deep in my psyche, this idea that there's something wrong just because we made a mistake with us, intrinsically wrong with us. And we know Unity's teachings are quite the opposite, right? We are born of original blessing. We are, are made in the image and the likeness of God, we're told in Genesis. So we are whole, we are complete. But there is a shadowy side, and often it comes from our religious teachings, that says we're not enough. We're not good enough. We'll never be good enough until we, and fill in the blanks with whatever it is, please enough people, <laughs> do exactly what everybody wants, be a good girl or a good boy, and that just continues all the way up through our lives, unless we stop and reveal it. So what happened in the story is very much what happens through our own lives of revealing, of unveiling. There's a, you know, one of the places we always go for great inspiration in the Bible is the book of Lamentations, right? <laughs> I was hoping Darlene would lead some laughter there so you'd get it if you didn't know the Bible very well. You know, Lamentations is like lamenting our lot, right? We just, you know, just don't typically go there. 
But I did find a scripture there that, that really fit. It's, it's uh, 4.2, and in Lamentations 4.2, it says, the precious sons of Zion, how they are worth their weight in fine gold and regarded as earthen pots. Precious sons of Zion. So let me break that down for a minute, because of course we know it's sons and daughters. We're all included. This is another thing from my Lutheran background. I always wanted to be an acolyte. You know, go up and light the candle, wear the robes and light the candles at the beginning of the service, but I couldn't because I was a girl. I couldn't figure out what, what about gender makes it okay to light the candles or not light the candles, right? <laughs> and just one other thing on that experience. In the confirmation class, our minister would have us um, write, take a pencil, and in the margin of the Bible, you would write an arrow down if God was speaking to man, and it was man, and an arrow up if man was speaking to God. So, you know, it's really ingrained in me that this is the way it works. God's outside or coming down to our, our human low experience, right? So where was I? I was somewhere else and went off on a tangent, didn't I? <laughs> Lamentations. So um, the Zion means Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, we understand to mean metaphysically spiritual center. So whenever you read in the Bible that we're going to Jerusalem, we're moving closer to our spiritual center. So if we now say this verse, understanding that, it's the precious sons and daughters of spirit, worth their weight in fine gold, how they are regarded as earthen pots. The truth about us is that we are worth our weight in fine gold, and yet we think we are an earthen pot. We regard ourselves as earthen pots. Now, I'm quite fond of our earthen pots. I think these bodies are temples that are worthy of really rejoicing and, and upholding the valley, value of, of the wholeness of who we are. Our bodies, our minds, our hearts, our spirits, all of it, holy and divine. You know, we are holy and profane, I guess you could say. You know, human and divine. I like to say soul and soil because we're connected with the earth. You know, we are a part of this earth. It's not less than. It's equal to. But when we talk about our worth, we have to dig for the gold inside, look for the light. Jesus said we are salt of the earth and light of the world. And so it's a both and. And the monks knew that. The earthen pot Buddha was, was very much, you know, revered. And then, wow, even more so when the gold was revealed, the shiny light came forth. So what happens in the story is very much what happens for us in revealing our worth and recognizing our intrinsic value. What happens in the story first is there is a shift, right? The, the, the statue is going to be moved, just like there is a movement in our own lives, some kind of shift that occurs to create that little bit of crumbling. Can anybody relate to any, any kind of change in your life? <laughs> You know, maybe retirement, having children, taking care of parents, moving, um, you know, on and on it goes. Changing careers, finding a new job, leaving a job, you know, new relationship, getting married, you know, on and on. This is life, right? There are shifts that happen for us all the time in our lives. However, we don't always make the inner shift, but all of you in this room, I know, are on a very conscious spiritual journey, and so you're very much aware that the inner and the outer go together. And so what happens in the story, who sees the shift? The head monk. That's important, because who sees the inner shift in us? The highest part of us, right? The divine in us, the witness in us that can sit back and see all of it for what it is. And that witness will see both the light and the stuff that's been put over the light. What is that kind of shame, that mud that we've put over that light over the years? How is it that we've believed ourselves to be something less than what we are? And so if we can see it all for what it is, when we do see how we have criticized ourselves or how we have shamed ourselves or how we have allowed other people's words or ideas to seep deep into our own consciousness, it makes, generally, it makes us pretty sad. It's like the, the rain that comes, the tears that come. It helps melt away that outer layer. Brene Brown says that shame cannot survive being spoken and it cannot survive empathy. 
And so when we break the silence, when we expose ourselves, when we put it out there, there is a breaking away, an opening that happens. And so what else does the one who sees, the one who looks, what else do they see? Well, they see with eyes that do not judge. It's one of the things I absolutely love about my prayer partnership with Darlene, that she sees me with eyes that do not judge. And so I have an aid in that process of taking off those layers of mud and revealing who I am. And I know that I can do that without judgment. And not everybody, I, ho I wish that, it's my greatest wish for everyone, that you do find at least one person in your life who can be that for you, who can hold that kind of space for you, who can empathize with you and see you and, and be in that kind of space with no judgment. And let you put out into the light and expose whatever it is that you think is some terrible, deep, dark secret or even if it's not some terrible, deep, dark secret, it's something maybe that you have some embarrassment around, or, you know, because it's that breaking the secrecy and the silence that will allow it to fall away. Another aspect of judgment, which, again, Brene Brown says three things to exponentially grow, secrecy, silence, and judgment. Another thing is comparison. Anybody ever compare themselves to anyone? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt, our former president, said, comparison is the thief of joy. That's all I have to remember to shift myself out when I'm comparing myself. As soon as I start doing that and I become aware of it, I go, comparison is the thief of joy, and I do not want to contribute to robbing myself of joy. Do you? No way, no how. Life's too short, right? Right? We want to live that joy. We want to be that joy. That is our intrinsic value in expression. That is a knowingness of who we are. And so not allowing that to be taken away in any way is a part of seeing. In 1 John 3.21, he says, Beloved, do not let your hearts condemn yourself. If we do not... <laughs> allow our hearts to condemn ourselves. We will have boldness before God. So that's that kind of wide open exposure, open heart, willing, stripped down. I'm here. I'm available. I'm not condemning. I'm not blocking the good. I'm not blocking the light. This is where the block is. That's why I say shame is the shadow of worth. That's where our work is. So that we can unblock and let that light shine. So, beloved, do not let your hearts condemn so that you can be bold in the divinity that you are, in the truth that you are. And it goes, the scripture goes on to say, so that we can receive from God whatever it is that we ask. So that's being in that flow, and we do that by not judging, by not self-judging, by not criticizing, by not condemning. So there's the shift and there's the seeing and not judging that happens in the story, that happens in our story, that happens in every one of our lives. And notice too that in the story that there's nothing that has to be added to the statue to make it more valuable, right? So too it is with our journey. Meister Eckhart, the 14th century monk, or mystic, and monk, really, <laughs> said that the, the soul's journey is not a process of addition, it's a process of subtraction. That's it. It's a stripping away. It's already here. We're already whole and well, and we're already valuable, and we already have all these qualities in us, this peace, this joy, this love, everything that we could ever want is there. And it's just a matter of letting it be seen, stripping away. One of my favorite practices of this kind of thing is a vision quest type of practice where you fast from food, shelter, and company in the desert. And very much like in the tradition of our desert mothers and fathers or indigenous people, this idea of just stripping away, stripping away what is not me, so what is me can be seen, what is me can be experienced, what is me can be shown, that light. And so whatever your practice is, or maybe some practices that you might want to explore, this idea of stripping away, coming empty, coming fully present to the divine is, I believe, a pathway that allows us to really claim our worth. And so we see, and we shift, and we see, and we subtract. Nothing left to do but shine.
That's who we are. That's the truth of who we are. That's the truth of who you are. So my greatest wish for you is that individually and collectively as a community that you shine that light. Like Jesus said, you are the light of the world and a city built on a hill cannot hide the light. So shine it for all. And I see that happening here at Unity of Blue Ridge and I see it happening in each of your lives. And what a celebration, what a joy, what a, what a beautiful radiant light you have. God bless you.